Thank you all for joining us this evening for the Department of Religious Studies annual Kirk Lecture. The James Kirk Lectureship is the product of an initiative taken by faculty members of the Department of Religious Studies in the mid 1990s to honor one of the founding members and former chairs of the department. James A. Kirk began as a part-time faculty member in the department in 1956. While he was pursuing a Doctor of Theology degree at Iliff School of Theology, he was hired as a full-time faculty member, member in 1959. In the early years of his teaching, his focus was philosophy of religion, which had been his doctoral concentration. His interest migrated to Asian religions, nourished by a year spent in India and Japan. In 1972, he published Stories of the Hindus by Macmillan Press, a textbook that was widely adopted in colleges and universities around the country. Due to Kirk's comparative interest and pioneering involvement in interreligious dialogue, the goal in establishing the lectureship was to foster greater understanding of the important role of religion plays in the world and in American civic and life and discourse. Former speakers have included Gustav Niebuhr, Jody Magnus, David Carrasco, Anthony Penn, Angela Zito, Anthea Butler, Michael Langlios, and Robert Orsi. We are delighted to have another eminent light in the field joining us here this evening. The Kirk Lecture takes tremendous effort to organize, and I would particularly like to thank Gretchen Hefner and Alicia <laughs> Stockhold, our administrative colleagues in the department who have overseen all the logistical planning. I would also <laughs> like to thank our student workers. I would now like to turn the floor over to our, another departmental colleague, Carl Ransky, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Jason. Um, we're very honored uh, tonight to have uh, one of the eminent scholars uh, in the humanities. Um, and in fact, uh, he crosses many disciplines uh, and he's known in many parts of the world. I can see even by the participants tonight that we have visitors to this lecture from all parts of the planet. He. Uh, we had a conference last week uh, that uh, um, had scholars presenting on the question of decoloniality from all over the world. Uh, so um, we're talking, of course, here about Walter uh, Mignola. Uh, well, uh, professor Mignola is William Hayne Wanamaker, a distinguished professor of Romance Studies at Duke University. Um, his research and teaching have been devoted in the past 30 years to understanding and unraveling the historical foundations of the modern colonial world system. And I stress modern slash colonial because in Professor Mignola's thought, uh, the two go together and have to be understood in tandem with each other. The world system and the world imaginary since 1500. Uh, in his research, uh, modern colonial world systems are is a mat is tantamount with, with the historical foundation of Western civilization and its expansion around the globe. His research stands on four basic premises. A, uh, there is no world system before 1500 and the integration of America in the Western Christian um, uh, European imaginary. B, that the world system generated the idea of newness, that is the so-called new world and of modernity. See that there is no modernity without coloniality. Coloniality is constitutive, not derivative of, of modernity. And D, the modern colonial imaginary was mounted and maintained on the invention of the human and humanity that provided the point of reference for the invention of racism and sexism together with the invention of nature. Briefly stated, uh, Professor Mignolo's research has been and continues to be to de devoted to exposing modernity. Coloniality is a machine that generates and maintains injustices and to ex exploring 
decolonial ways of delinking from, from the modernity coloniality, coloniality complex. Because the political dimension of his work in the past 15 years, Professor Mignolo's energy has been increasingly devoted to the public sphere, working with artists, curators, and with journalists, writing op-eds and giving frequent interviews in English and Spanish, co-organizing and co-teaching summer schools in Middleburg, Bremen, and at U the University of North Carolina, Duke. He's also frequently delivering workshops for faculty and graduate students in South and Central America, Asia, and Europe. Uh, Professor Mignola was awarded the Catherine Singer Kovacs Prize uh, for his book, which is a kind of foundational work, which was what first drew me uh, myself in my own research into his writings. Uh, it's called The Darker Side of the Renaissance, Literacy, Territoriality, and Colonization, which was published in 1996. And he's also the recipient of the Franz Fanon Prize by the Caribbean Philosophical Association for the Idea of Latin America in 2006. His work has been translated into German, Italian, French, Swedish, Romanian, Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, and Korean. He is an honorary research associate for the Center for Indian Studies in South Africa, which University of Johannesburg, and recently he joined the Dialogue of Civilizations or DOC Program Council as a senior advisor and was distinguished with a honoris causa degree in the humanities um, by the Univers Universidad de Buenos Aires, Argentina. So I will now turn it over to our distinguished guest, uh, Professor Mignolo. Well, that was a <clears throat> very nice introduction, Carl, but uh, first I would like to say that I am really pleased and honored to have been selected for this Kirk lecture. <clears throat> and I thank also uh, Professor Andrea Stanton for extending the invitation. Carl Rach, I don't know if I pronounce your last name well. <clears throat> Roger Green and Victor Taylor <clears throat> that may be in the audience for kind of making the connection. Uh, so all of that has been a really nice conversation since, uh, I don't know, October, November from last year. <clears throat> um, also kind of round table that we have last week, uh, and a panel that we will have tomorrow. So that has been a really fantastic uh, conversation, and that's what it is. Okay, so my uh, the title of my lecture is uh, the politics of the colonial investigations, in plural, investigations. Um, that is the title of my book, but tonight I will not talk about my book. Uh, probably for sure I will touch some issues, but that is not my purpose. My purpose is to talk about the politics of the colonial investigation as an issue, and the issue that precisely kind of uh, drove me into writing this book after kind of a, a long time. Um, <clears throat> so the second thing I want to say, uh, decoloniality now is a controversial, uh, very much used, at the same time controversial, and the same time ambiguous. Um, <clears throat> so if you ask me what is coloniality in terms of a definition, I would say, I don't know. But uh, I will say first, I don't know, but I will tell you tonight what I understand. Decoloniality is for me and for the people I am working with. So, but to understand decoloniality in the way we use it, when I, every time I say we, um, I refer to a collective that was formed uh, in the last years of the 20th century, um, and this, uh, uh, known as modernity coloniality slash decoloniality. The founder members or the first generation, let's put it that way, was Aníbal Quijano, Enrique Dussel, Maria Lugones, Catherine Walsh and myself. And now we are already having a kind of second generation that is beyond uh, Latin America. And you, can, you can find those in Europe and uh, even in Russia. So, um, 
I will proceed uh, tonight to kind of uh, tell you what I and how we understand the coloniality. But uh, again, we have to understand coloniality first because the way we understand the colonial, I mean, they are both kind of uh, two sides of the same coin. So I will, I will have uh, four, uh, four parts. In the first part, I will give you a context where I'm coming from and a signpost of whom we are talking to, not just me, but other members of them. Then I will go into some, uh, for people who may not know Quijano, I will just devote some time to uh, some of the basic ideas of uh, Quijano foundational text, coloniality, modernity, the rationality, the published in 1992. Uh, then uh, in the third part, I will talk about the totality of knowledge and the totality of knowledge to put it in another world will be the world, uh, the uh, Western civilization, or in the vocabulary of the last week, uh, Western cognitive empire. That is kind of the totality of knowledge. So what I will present tonight is the kind of uh, underlying structure of Western civilization or Western cognitive empire. So those are the kind of the surface expression. And the, the, the last part, I will, um, I will uh, end up with the task today of decoloniality, what, is, what we are up to, uh, up to after Quijano. And that is, uh, I, I kind of titled that, Nociologic and Aesthetic Reconstitutions. And this, yes, is, is one of the key arguments in my book. So now I will go into, I think I have to be co-host but uh, to, to share the screen, to show my, they say that I am not a host. I forgot to answer that before. <laughs> I've updated it for you. You should be able to share now. Yes. Well. I don't see it. I don't see it. The... Ah, now yes. But something happened here. Okay, now you can see it, right? Yes? Yeah, okay. So, the politics of the colonial investigation. Uh, let's start with a kind of definition of the decolonization, or let's see definition, the etymology. And apparently the word decolonization uh, was used in a political sense by, a, uh, by in a speech of Honorable W. H. Seward in New York in 1853. And as you see in the quotation, he was referring to decolonization as the independence of uh, American Revolution, as we call today, that happened in 1776. So in that sense, I, I mean, uh, the, the American Revolution was decolonization from the point of view of uh, the descendant, um, well, the settler that was descendant of the, uh, the original colonial settler. So that is kind of to give you uh, a context of where decolonization, but of course decolonization really became a big word during the Cold War. Huh? Uh, so let's uh, move now to part one, the kind of the uh, context. 
So um, I put this, I will come back at the end, but um, just to give you the summary before the talk. <laughs> Coloniality is underlying logic of European colonization since 1500, as Carl said. So coloniality should not be confused with colonization. Coloniality doesn't equal colonization. Anti-coloniality should not confuse, be confused with decolonization. They are related, in, uh, uh, no doubt, but I think a, a lot of confusion today can be because of lack of distinction between coloniality and colonization, anti-coloniality and decolonization. And I hope that my lecture tonight, if not, it doesn't clarify, at least will help you to think about this issue. So uh, myself personally, uh, after writing The uh, Darker Side of Renaissance, where I spent 12 years studying the colonization um, of the new world, since I was not a political scientist or economist or historian, I was a semiotician and I still am. Uh, I studied the colonization through sign, like colonization of languages, colonization of memory, which is history, and colonization of a space, which is the cartography. But in 95, just when the manuscript was, was, uh, was finished, I encountered not Quijano personally, but an art, this article by him. And that put everything together because it made me understand that coloniality is the underlying logic of all the colonialists that started in the Atlantic in the 1500, 1492 if you wish, uh, and the new war was the foundational moment of what will happen before, when France and, uh, and the Dutch and and, uh, the, uh, and England uh, kind of expands, uh, yeah, to the new world, but also mainly to Africa and Asia. So this is uh, for me the kind of the foundational uh, stone of everything that uh, I have been uh, doing since 95. Uh, <clears throat> So from Quijano, we learn that uh, while colonization is over, coloniality is not over. It's, all, it's not over, it's all over, and so is decoloniality. So that is the kind of assumption. Um, and you know, assumption, they are never rational. In physics, in mathematics, in the hard science, all assumptions and principles are non-rational, are kind of intuition. So this is a kind of um, basic assumption of what we call, um, what we do, what we do uh, in the name of decoloniality. So the second, the second moment in this kind of uh, Quijano's legacy was Maria Lugones, who in uh, 2007 published another um, a landmark article, Heterosexualism and the Colonial Modern Gender System. And so much of what this today uh, uh, goes under the name of decolonial feminism um, have a lot to do, not all, but uh, a lot to do with uh, this article. And this article, she kind of uh, start from um, Quijano. She critiqued him for his approach to gender but at the same time built on Quijano, and Quijano recognizes that. You know? uh, so these are the two basic, but also we are in conversation and, and here comes the, the kind of the signpost, that kind of the, the branch of the dialogue, the conversation we have uh, from this kind of uh, Quijano Lugones Foundation. One of them, and we have been working, and uh, especially Catherine Walsh has been working with these people, uh, Amautaiwasi in Quito, Ecuador. Uh, Amautaiwasi is a, pluriverse, a, a pluriversity, not a university, proposed by the Quichua, uh, the Pueblos Originarios, the Quichua, Quichua, not Quechua, but Quichua, 
And the plur the uni the pluriversity was kind of uh, the foundation was based on uh, Andean cosmology. Andean cosmology that as many if not all cosmologies in the new world um, it start kind of based with the four directions that when the sun rises, when the sun sets, the left and the right, etc. And there is all a kind of uh, very complicated things, but in the Andes, uh, this kind of four direction was also model, uh, modeled on the Southern Cross. And the Southern Cross cannot be seen from the North. But that was like, uh, that, that, that was the Andean, and uh, especially the kind of the, uh, the last period before the invasion of the Incanate, of the Inca in the Andes, and that is what they will call Tawantinsuyu. So Tawantinsuyu is the world divided in four, and the model was the Southern Cross and the connection between land, earth, and the cosmos. So we have been working with um, uh, people there uh, working on this and related issue for a long time. Uh, now what happened? Um, another kind of conversation, uh, not as intense, but also paying a lot of attention to Maori Linda Tihiwai Smith. As many of you know, especially in Denver, where you work a lot with uh, Native American, uh, her book on the colonizing methodology uh, has been uh, a classic since. Uh, her, her influence has been significant, uh, more than significant, uh, <laughs> tremendous, I would say. Um, in Canada, in the United States, there is a translation in, uh, in, into Spanish. But there is a problem here between the kind of the history of the people who have been colonized by the Spanish or the Portuguese and the people who have been colonized by the British. But anyhow, I mean, um, um, many of us um, kind of uh, are in common. I had a conversation in, in, in New Zealand in 2019, a kind of public conversation uh, that lasted about one hour and a half and, and was fantastic to kind of uh, enter into dialogue how what is decolonization for her and what is decoloniality decolonization for us uh, after Quijano. I don't know what is happening here. So another uh, another signpost that is very very important for us and she also kind of connect is Sylvia Winter. Sylvia Winter work is uh, very uh, since 1976, uh, 76, she's Caribbean, she's Jamaican. Uh, but this, I mentioned this article because this article is where uh, there is an explicit connection between Afro-Caribbean um, sense of decolonization for them, the question of the human, of humanity is central. Uh, and this article came from an encounter we have in Biganton, uh, where among other, other people, uh, Aníbal Quijano and myself, uh, were there. So, um, and just, I will mention here, uh, we have a few conversations with Googie, but for me, Googie, and for many other people, was uh, very influential because in 86, when he published the book, um, I, I was working on the right uh, on the darker side of Renaissance. So decolonizing the mind was a very much uh, a, com a conversation among people who were kind of um, kind of studying, doing investigation on the new world in the colonization, because '92 was approaching. So uh, this is just to give you an idea of uh, the map, where are the kind of ideas I am uh, working with. So now let's go to part two.
and I hope that I am making sense of that. <clears throat> um, part two is a kind of, as I said, a kind of uh, digging a little bit into that uh, landmark article by Kikano that is all only 10 pages long, but what kind of generated the project, modernity, coloniality, decoloniality. So what has to, is very important here, coloniality is a decolonial and third world concept. It's not a disciplinary concept. Quijano is, uh, was a sociologist, but uh, more than a sociologist, he was an activist that uh, during the 70s, he was involved in all the kind of debates on dependency theory. And it's from that dependency theory uh, debate that he came into the idea of coloniality, but also because Peru has a 60% indigenous population. And he was a very good uh, friend of Jose Maria Arguedas, a very interesting character. He was not indigenous, but he was, he grew up with a kind of indigenous mother and he has a conflict all his life. He wrote several novels and in the last novel, he is the story about his own uh, suicide. And the question is because of that, he couldn't deal with that kind of tension between Quechua and Spanish uh, culture, language, etc. Colonization, on the, other, on the other hand, is a modern concept. And I show you before, uh, I don't know if that is the first time, but colonization um, is a concept of what become uh, the, uh, the, uh, the first world. Probably was not a Europe, was probably was a US uh, concept, but then colonization became a concept of the first world of the, the North Atlantic to uh, describe their own kind of expansion around the globe. So these are some of the kind of the quotation by, um, by Quijano that, um, so that kind of, uh, these are kind of the kind of historical observation that will lead to the concept of coloniality. So with the conquest of the society and the culture we uh, inhabit today is called Latin America, the constitution, and this is a very important concept because later on he will uh, define decolonization and then decoloniality as epistemological reconstitution. So the constitution of a new world order culminating 500 years later in a global power covering the whole planet. So that is coloniality. Uh, coloniality, as I said, is the underlying structure of Western civilization. Uh, we are speaking, I mean, Quijano, myself, from, from the South and, uh, and also from the North, but from the new world but it's not about the new world. It's about the globe, about the planet, because we are very aware that, I mean, not only the German, the French, and the British, and, uh, and the US Academy can talk about the world. And we kind of just talk about, we are talking of our culture. And I think that this is the first strong point of decoloniality. So the coloniality on the one hand is a task of understanding how the colonial, coloniality works, but the other hand is not just to know, to, to tell the truth or to improve some discipline, is to know how we are controlled in order to decide what we can do according to who we are, where are we, what is our uh, personal life, profession, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is a kind of the first approach of what decoloniality means. Um, so again, uh, is to investigate, and that is the, the, the problem that, around, that kind of took me to write the book. I mean, I want to do an investigation. I have been doing that, but that's a kind of reworking of I, what I have been done, uh, trying to understand, as Carl said in the introduction, 
how the colonial matrix of power uh, work from the 1500 to today and from China to South America to South, uh, Af South Africa to the United States. It's not a history. We don't write history. There are specific cases uh, within the colonial matrix of power that I kind of investigate according to my potential, um, my training and, uh, and my way of, uh, and, and also my biography. So the Western European dominators and the Euro-North American descendants are still the principal beneficiaries, together with the non-European part of the world, not quite former European colonies, Japan mainly, and, uh, and mainly the ruling classes. And I will say also that uh, the beneficiaries are the elite of the former colonies, be that United States, Australia, Argentina, uh, South Africa, well, South Africa a little bit different, but still. Uh, so the elites in each country uh, kind of become beneficiary of, um, of this kind of coloniality of power. Okay, and this is another crucial point uh, in Quijano's, uh, concept of uh, configuration, description, understanding of coloniality of power. So racist was kind of, if I will tell you more about the coloniality of, uh, metric, colonial metric of power later on, but race is the kind of the spine of the colonial metric of power. Coloniality of power was conceived together with America and Western Europe and with the social category of race as the key element of the social classification of colonizer and colonizer. And that is not just the America, is global, right? So that is kind of, uh, this is interesting to point out that this is one of the, the, the distinction between decoloniality as we understand it and Marxism. Sometimes we fight and sometimes we have nice talk, but the question is that to put it uh, in the sentence of uh, uh, Louis Gordon, a Jamaican philosopher, friend of us, uh, kind of working on the Caribbean Philosophical Association in conversation, he said, Europe smells like class. The Americas smells like race. And when you think about it, what we call capitalist today, for us, there is no capitalist before uh, the 15th, uh, 15th century. There are capitals, of course, there are banks, but coloniality, uh, kind of bring together um, classification and racial classification. And what is distinctive from this racial classification to all other classifications you can find before in China, in Persia, in Egypt, etc., were not based on biological and structurally superior and inferior. And biological in two sense, I mean, because in the 16th century, the Jews and Muslims were kind of expelled to maintain the purity of blood of Castile. So that's biological. And then little by little, um, there were not kind of Muslim and Jews da danger for, for Spain in the new world. So little by little, the, the question become uh, classified also by, by birth, what kind of people cross and produce, uh, generate a new generation. And then by the 19th century, skin uh, came to be the distinctive um, feature of race. So that is part of the history of the colonial matrix of power, not the history of the planet, not the history of Europe, the history of the colonial matrix of power, and that is the task of decolonial investigation. So here you have, I announce to you that I will give you a little bit more about what coloniality is. So coloniality of power is based up 
upon racial social classification. Classification, not class, classification. This is a um, key concept. I, who classifies? How classify? Classify whoever control knowledge and have a structure of knowledge that allow him or her and the institution to classify and make people believe that this is reality. So race pervaded and modulated the basic instances of Eurocentric capitalist colonial modern world power to become the cornerstone of coloniality of power. And the other key concept that get, they derived from here is Eurocentrism, uh, cultural coloniality and modernity rationality. So Quijano comes from, uh, he was a Marxist. Uh, he was critic, uh, critiquing uh, historical materialism. But all the people in uh, uh, working on dependency theory were some kind of Marxist, uh, <coughs> one more than other. But Quijano was a Marxist. Uh, he, I mean, uh, a follower of Jose Carlos Mariatic, uh, uh, more or less contemporary of a Gramsci in, in Peru, but less known because Mariette was uh, South American and Gramsci was European, so uh, Gramsci is better known. Uh, <clears throat> so Quijano was uh, paying a lot of attention to the economy, but at the same time to subjectivity. So for him, coloniality is not just a control of kind of economy, political, military, etc is the control of subjectivity. And how you control subjectivity? Not by public policy, not, um, you control it by knowledge. And knowledge that justify and legitimize attitudes. Hmm? So if you are a plantation owner, for example, yeah, you have enslaved people, but at the same time you have a, a, a knowledge and a belief that you are doing the right things and the people who are working for you are inferior and they are black and they are inferior. So the question of uh, subjectivity is, uh, is the colonial method of power touches both ends of the spectrum because kind of modulate the subjectivity of the plantation owner or the IMF or the White House and the people who are enslaved or the people who are governed, like us, for example. So the cultural complex known as U, uh, European modernity rationality was being constituted through uh, cultural coloniality, subjectivity, making people believe in the rest of the world that they are inferior and uh, they have to modernize, they have to <coughs> uh, Europeanize, etc. Et so Eurocentrism, what is Eurocentrism? is the order of the world to the benefit of uh, and to the perception of European control in the institution, <coughs> controlling the language of knowledge, controlling the discipline, etc. So that is important for Quijano, the intersubjective universe produced by the entire Eurocentric capitalist colonial power was elaborated and formalized by European and established in the world as an exclusive European product and as a universal paradigm of knowledge. Such confluence between coloniality and the elaboration of rationality, modernity was not in any way accidental. So this is why we say that coloniality is the darker side of modernity. There is no modernity without coloniality. And the breaking point in Quijano 92 is that up to that point, everybody was talking about modernity as modernity was the totality. <laughs> and so Quijano showed us that no, 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 uh, modernity is just half of the story. And the other half of the story is hidden. It's hidden by the rhetoric of modernity. The rhetoric of modernity is how it, it presents itself as progress, civilization, development, the future of humanities, etc., etc. Okay, so now we move to part three, 
also kind of derived from uh, from Quijano, but I mean, in 20, almost 30 years, uh, there is a lot of derivation. Quijano himself, until uh, 2015, has been rewriting and revising and also kind of adapting his thesis to the changing world because the world in 1992 was very different to the world in 2010, for example. So Quijano was very attentive and he wrote a lot about this kind of thing. So totality of knowledge or <laughs> the Western cognitive empire or Western civilization. That is what we say that uh, the colonial nature of power, coloniality of power for short, is the underlying structure of Western civilization and the darker side of Western modernity. One of the, uh, um, he said, I mean, he elaborated on that and you can read the article if you need more kind of detail, but uh, I'm just looking at the time here, the totality of knowledge, he kind of put the accent on how in the West knowledge was related to capitalism in the sense that has been conceived as property but property, individual property, knowledge, he said, knowledge is never individual and isolated. Knowledge is always intersubjective, uh, interconnected, but the cognitive Western empire put the individual, the ego in the center, as we know. So he elaborated on that in relation to philosophy, to science, etc., etc. But the question, the, the central question is that Western totality of knowledge is uh, related to uh, the sacralization of the individual in a secular moment uh, and knowledge as property. And we have it today, no intellectual property, uh, no, no plagiarism, etc., etc. So the colonial nature of power, the underlying structure of Western civilization, of Western cognitive empire. So here, uh, Quijano elaborated a little bit more about what just uh, say, you know? um, So the individual exists, but it exists as differentiated part, but not separated of an intersubjective uh, or in, uh, intersubjectivity or intersubjective dimension of social relationship. So that was 92, and then now we kind of working with indigenous people and say, yeah, it's true, uh, but it's not just intersubjectivity and relation in society, but in the communal, and the communal in the Andes and in the south of Mexico is the relationship of the people with earth and with the cosmos. And Quijano understood that uh, uh, toward 2010, 2015. So knowledge becomes a crucial target of decoloniality. Knowledge in this perspective is an intersubjective relation for the purpose of something, not a relation between an isolated subjectivity and that something. So decolonial investigation it has a purpose. And what the purpose is, is to reconstitute the reconstitution of what the colonial matrix of power destituted. It's not just to tell the truth or to improve the discipline, but what is the purpose of coloniality of knowledge and what is the purpose of decoloniality of knowledge? So that is why coloniality of knowledge and the coloniality of knowledge kind of uh, goes together because coloniality destitute and decoloniality are the task, if you can say, different way of decolonizing knowledge uh, to reconstitute what has been destituted. For example, today, one of the things we talk a little bit, uh, a, lo a lot, is that um, Western knowledge separate, separated us for, for, from life. And they call it nature. And so nature separated from us also then become, uh, as uh, Francis Bacon said, uh, to be known and dominated by men. And then after the Industrial Revolution became natural. 
uh, resources and in the 20th century we human are human uh, resources no? uh, so this is uh, what i was saying a little bit uh, before nevertheless property like knowledge is a relation between people for the purpose of something not a relation between an individual and something i own so he elaborate on this kind of uh Articulation, correspondence, transference. Uh, the, concept, the concept of property in capitalist economy and the concept of knowledge in Western modernity. So uh, to kind of start kind of closing this a little bit, the totality of Western knowledge or not North Atlantic Universal, as uh, Rolf through you puts it, another another person that uh, unfortunately uh, past, past, but uh, he was in conversation also. Uh, the totality, he, he's a Haitian, a Haitian anthropologist, he was. The totality of Western knowledge, North Atlantic Universals, is supported and constituted by two basic conceptual structure and belief systems. So that we go uh, into, in our perspective, the kind of the foundational basis of the colonial matrix of power. Western Christian theology, as you know better than I, uh, that kind of brought kind of the conjunction between secular, <laughs> put it away, secular uh, and Greek, uh, Greece, I mean the philosopher Aristotle and St. Thomas Summa Theolo Theologiae. And the Western, Western secular science and philosophy that when you analyze it in detail, Western secular science and philosophy is Christian theology without God. We have been seeing that uh, in the South for kind of, uh, um, yeah, from Quijano, but a, a little bit before too, and also, I was uh, kind of pleased in uh, 2003 when I read Carl Schmitt, um, I think, a political theology, that uh, he said it. He said it in this way: the difference is, of course, that uh, that uh, the purpose of Carl Schmitt, uh, Carl Schmitt, is as uh, he uh, he mentioned, uh, is Eurocentric to the interests of Europe. He didn't say Eurocentric in a pejorative way. He said it in a descriptive way. Now, to go into the question of the totality of knowledge and the uh, Western cognitive empire, so both control the academic, the Christian theology and Western secular science, control the academic vocabulary as well as the public vocabulary in the six modern imperial European languages, Italian, Spanish, Portuguese, French, German, and English. So, and their translation in the public sphere through education in the secondary school, the journalists, uh, the television, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that is the question we have now. The target is to understand how this kind of Western uh, cognitive empire works. But at the same time, as the conference last week said, is disintegrating. Well, the coloniality doesn't, it's not guilty of the disintegration, but, uh, but the fact is, and I will probably say something more, that it is disintegrating. Why? Because uh, by 2000, a lot of people around the planet began to understand what was going on. So what Quijano understood in 1992 uh, was not kind of an isolated case in South America. There was kind of something in the air that people began to kind of realize. And the disintegration, to go quickly, in a, has a, a great deal to do with people don't believe anymore in the universality of North Atlantic Universal. So that, uh, that is kind of uh, happening uh, at the level of the state, like 
China, Iran, Russia. I call that de-Westernization. And is also uh, going uh, at the level of the political society, the people who are organizing themselves. Uh, and that is the kind of the sphere of decoloniality. Not that they call themselves decoloniality, but they are reconstituting themselves in relation to uh, the shame, as Leanne Simpson will say, that kind of Western expansion uh, projected uh, into them. Okay, so part four. And I think I am fine with that. So here is, um, we enter into the terrain of what I said before, nociological and aesthetic reconstitution. We said aesthetic to refer to all those observations that Quijano made in the name of subjectivity. How subjectivity is controlled, modulated, but at the same time, how this, at this point, this kind of subjectivity began to rebel. Began to rebel and began to disobey what the kind of the control of subjectivity allow or put them in a position up to that point. So Quijano in 92 talk about epistemological reconstitutions. And that he said that decolonization. And then we change it into decoloniality. Why? Because decolonization during the Cold War have a different purpose to build their own, the, the, the native nation state. At the same time, during the Cold War, the legacy, the legacy of decolonial thinking is tremendous. So from Gandhi at the border of the kind of the beginning of the Cold War to Biko, Fanon, Cesar, Kruma, Cabral, uh, Lumumba, I don't know. It. So there is a rich um, archive of decolonial thinking that, yes, we are kind of uh, respecting and kind of connecting and thinking through them. As the difference is that uh, Quijano is thinking from the Andes. It's not thinking from Nigeria, it's not thinking from South Africa, it's not thinking from India. Uh, so that is very important for us because that is what comes with the, the bring the idea of pluriversality. So there is not a universal model of decoloniality. Decoloniality means precisely pluriversality and people decolonize according to their own local histories, according to their own body constitution, how each of us, each of them kind of felt coloniality because you cannot understand coloniality rationally. Coloniality, you sense it. You have to sense it. If you don't sense it, it's very difficult to kind of um, understand. I mean, again, you can understand rationally, but that is a different kind of uh, dimension. We are talking from uh, experiences of living, like Quijano and myself and Dussel, we are not indigenous of South America. We are not uh, Afro descendants uh, from South America, but uh, we are, I mean, we are our ancestor of European descent um, have been uh, living together for 500 years. So we are talking more as a kind of third world intellectual, Quijano and Dussel and myself are third world intellectual, also immigrant from immigrant family. So that is what a kind of uh, epistemological reconstitution comes. Uh, so Quijano is uh, very clear about this, what this mean. And that is important to quote that because there is a lot of uh, also uh, misunderstanding. People say, oh, you are rejecting modernity. No, no, we are not rejecting modernity. That doesn't, <laughs> that is not possible and makes no sense. Modernity is there. Uh, Western modernity is there, it's in all of us, all over the world. 
So we recognize that. The question is that we uh, don't accept the aberrations. And the aberration of modernity was to pretend that the rest of the world has to be like kind of North Atlantic. So that, no. Modernity, yes. So the critique of European paradigm of rationality modernity is indispensable. So that is the task of the colonial investigation. Even more urgent. But it is doubtful if the criticism consists of a simple negation of all its categories. That is clear. That is not the point. It's not going to the mountain and kind of uh, negating. Uh, the point is, it's necessary to extricate oneself. And that also comes the concept of the linking to connect with Samir Amin, who used La Deconnexion in French in 1989. He was talking about La Deconnexion from capitalism. Uh, so we respect, uh, honor Samir Amin, but at the same time say, no, the question is not to the link. The link, the linking was the translation into English of Samir Amin, La Deconnexion. Uh, so the question is not to, um, <clears throat> to reject, but to the link, to extricate oneself from what modernity want us, Western modernity want us to be. How you do that? Well, that is a big discussion. Um, so because is how you do decolonization uh, under the umbrella of decoloniality, in the same way as uh, how you do modernization under the umbrella of modernity. Or, uh, yeah, okay. So let's go to the, ah, part four. Uh, I got a little bit confused here. But yeah, part four is, um, is derived from what I just said, the epistemic, uh, epistemic reconstitution that I just explained. So here we have the, ah, I didn't, I didn't do this properly. I should have done that, that's why. So uh, derived from Quijano, we move into nociologic and anesthetic reconstitutions. Why? Because, well, we use, uh, uh, when we talk about aesthetic anesthesis, we are not talking about the beautiful and the sublime, we are talking about subjectivity, about sensing. So aesthesis, aesthesis is the, um, is, is means that uh, in, uh, in ancient Greek. And then in the 18th century was kind of uh, mutated into aesthetic and then come von Garden, Kant, Hegel, etc. And nociologic was uh, something that was destituted from the Western vocabulary and also as thesis, both were destituted from um, Western vocabulary. Uh, and, uh, and nociology, as many of you should know, I mean, it's related to knowledge. And in the 17th century, I think something like that, uh, 18th century perhaps, nociology me meant uh, theory of, no, of, of knowledge, Theo theory de la connaissance, uh, nociologie, theory de la connaissance uh, in French. But then epistemology and aesthetic destituted both. So the question for us now is that if we use epistemic or epistemological reconstitution and aesthetic reconstitution, we remain within the limits and the restriction of those two uh, hegemonic Western concept. So extricating ourselves from that bring the question of nociology and a thesis. And by doing that, we do two things. Epistemology is part of nociology because nociology refers to all kinds of knowledge, scientific, theological, or not. <laughs> to the kind of knowledge of the people, uh, cosmologies that have been destituted from Western cosmology under the name of theology, 
uh, knowledges in languages that are not uh, European, uh, people making things that are not recognized by Western art and aesthetic. I have a friend, uh, Benvenuto Chavajai, who is, an, uh, he said, an artisto, he's Maya Kichie. Uh, and he said, um, he's, I mean, he uh, did a several, a few, no, say he's young, uh, a few exhibit by himself, but uh, solo, but also exhibit in other um, uh, kind of galleries or museum. And he said, no, I am not doing art. I am doing chunches. And chunches in Maya Kichie mean cosas. I am making cosas. So actually, that's what poiesis meant. But then poiesis that means to make, with Aristotle became just at that quite another level. And so the question was uh, the distinction between what the shoemaker makes and what Sophocles make. So that's the kind of hierarchy that began to uh, began to be. Uh, 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 taking taking hold of it. So in the last minute, I will kind of give you uh, a map of uh, what I have been saying so far. Remember, I underline the word constitution um, in two of the quote by Quijano. So this is a map. Uh, it's not to be applied. <laughs> um, it, uh, and a map, as any kind of map, guides you, let's say, in the city. So it tells you how, how to go or where, where you are when you are someplace and look at the map and try to find, I don't know, a kind of monument or a restaurant or whatever you are looking for. So this is a map, this is a guide. It's, uh, I insist, it's not a model, it's not to be applied, it's a guide to our own research uh, that we share, of course, and this is in the introduction of my book. So the constitution of the colonial metric of power uh, is the constitution mainly of four domains. How we decide on those domains, this is a reconstruction of the underlying logic of modernity, which is the logic of coloniality. So knowledge and understanding, that, that govern us all. Uh, there are political theory and there are political economy, but what are political economy and political theory if not knowledge? Yeah, people can produce and exchange and distribute, etc. do those kind of things, but people don't do that just because. People do that with certain purpose. They have certain knowledge and they act according to that kind of knowledge, belief. Belief is also part of it. So knowledge and understanding, we put it on top because it's what kind of permeates everything. And that Quijano, being a Marxist, put knowledge at the top. This is the problem we have to confront. Knowledge, modernity, coloniality control us. Through knowledge, we have to kind of confront that. So the other is governance, be the monarchic state of the 16th, 17th, up to the 18th century, be the nation state from the uh, 19th century. Today, there are still monarchies, some within nation state, like Spain or England, some just by themselves, like uh, <clears throat> southern, uh, I mean the western, the western Arab uh, state. And then you have the, uh, the economy. And the economy should be distinguished from capitalism. And, and that is the problem now for many people who accept or believe that capitalism and economy are the same thing. No, economy is one thing, and we can talk about the uh, the etymology of economy, etc. But there is a kind of economy that kind of began to uh, uh, unfold in the 16th century, 
is too long to explain, but I will say that there are two, uh, uh, two features that I would like to mention. One is the massive exploitation of uh, <coughs> land and expropriation, as we know, in the United States, in Denver, but also in Argentina. Uh, appropriation, expropriation, dispossession of land, and in economy, and an economy that after that began, began to convert the subjectivities into force or voluntary, living to work. Enslaved were forced, but in the 2021, uh, second half of the 20th century, 21st century, people <laughs> live to work joyfully. And they are really proud that they are so busy that they don't have time to do this, to chat, to have a cup of coffee, etc. So this is a society we see more and more and more that is uh, that we are living to work or that society wants us to live to work and we have to delink from that. How we do it? Well, that's another story. And the other key is the concept of the human. Uh, the human is not universal. The human is, uh, and humanity is the way that in, in the Middle Age, humanus, but also in the Renaissance, uh, the name, the vocabulary of the human species. And that goes to the uh, Anthropocene. It's a long story. Uh, but this concept of the human that kind of uh, was central in the Renaissance and the humanities in the Renaissance until, let's say, the, the, during the 15th century, until 1500, mutate and acquire another dimension when the human and humanity began to be the standard in relation to the rest of the people in the world. And that is why racism kind of when races appear. Uh, so the second thing I want to say that uh, these are not isolated domains. They are all kind of interconnected. But modernity wants us to kind of, uh, modernity invented the expert. So the expert uh, know a little bit about one thing, but uh, not much about the rest. For us, the decolonial investigation is to always keep um, be alert. If we see if we are kind of investigating this, we cannot forget about all of this. If we are investigating this, we cannot forget about all of this. So that is the domain. And in the center, and I will say um, underneath, um, is because we talk about all that. Yeah, that's the kind of the debate, the public debate, the state, the economy, race, the humanity, etc., etc., knowledge, but this we don't talk much. And this is what, this is the level of the enunciation that govern everything. And to go quick, there are, what, how is this form, how, what is this um, sustained? It's sustained, number one, by uh, institution, the church, the convent first, the university, the museum, private university, a research institution, etc., etc. Uh, but also banks, IMF, etc. So they are all institutions, and those institutions are ruled by actors, um, and those actors rule the institution who govern. Uh, the Western Cognitive Empire, in the six languages that I mentioned before, and more recently, more and more and only in English. So this is the level of the enunciation that control the four domains, and also kind of establish and hide the flux, the flow uh, between the domain. So I don't have much time, but this, this is the basic constitution. Once this is constituted, so ex, uh, begin the, I mean, simultaneously with the constitution is the destitution. The destitution of the communal, the communal wisdom, for example, that is knowing to live. The um, 
the destitution of uh, communal economy that is living to uh, um, is living in harmony, uh, summa causae, we say, etc. Uh, the destitution, I mean, in this case, the destitution of the communal, the kind of the organization of the communal, the destitution of the communal or economy, which is working to live, that is what we have to do, we cannot avoid it, and the destitution of the non-human, the lesser human, which is racist and sexist, and nature. Nature, race, and sex kind of work together in the destitution of the human and control of knowledge. And then comes the task of sociological or sociological and aesthetic reconstitution. That is the task. We are doing that. A lot of people are doing it. Uh, and there is, again, there is not a mother and not everybody does it in the name of decoloniality uh, and, uh, and Quijano. But when you think about what happened uh, in, in the United States uh, with the kind of tearing down the, the statues and the monument, that uh, those are kind of very clear example of what I'm trying to say. And I give you two, two examples, two, uh, two, two op-eds that I read uh, during that time. One was with a young uh, Afro-American, uh, and she said, well, that is okay to tear down the statue, but, uh, but it's okay because that allows, you, uh, uh, allows us to reconstitute our histories, our memories. I don't remember if she, if she used the word reconstitution, but that's what she was doing. Now is our time to reconstitute uh, what has been destituted because our history, our stories have been told only by the white people. And there was another white guy in a strategic culture that was very interesting because, yeah, I agree, he said, uh, I, I agree to tear down the kind of the founding fathers uh, a statue, but hey, the founding father are the founding father of the constitution. So what do we do with the constitution? So that is the moment of kind of claiming for the need to reconstitute the constitution that was written under such and such circumstance. And summing up from why I started, modernity, coloniality, the coloniality goes together because the day that modernity, coloniality disappear, decoloniality is no longer necessary. So modernity, coloniality, engender decoloniality, demand, provoke decoloniality. So parallel to that, we have modernity, domination, coloniality, exploitation, or oppression, as I said, Wikijano and uh, Lugones, and conflict. So one manifestation of the conflict, mani a manifestation and action, acted, is decoloniality. So modernity, domination, constitution, coloniality, exploitation, oppression, destitution, and the task of decoloniality, conflict, reconstitution. So, and that is that. <laughs> so thank you very much. And now I get out of here. <clears throat> Okay, well, thank you all. Uh, thank you, Walter, very much. Um, we have some questions. Uh, by the way, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, uh, not in the chat. Um, this is a function of webinars we don't have normally in, in Zoom seminars. So uh, I will take these um, in the order they were presented to us. So we have a, a question uh, from Timo but the needs, uh, is it possible to exist? Is it capital, is it possible for capitalism to exist without racism or for race and racism to exist without capitalism? Uh, shall I respond uh, one by one or? Yeah, if you don't yeah, mind. Yeah, I, I think I will, I respond that very quickly. And quick. since we have 15 minutes, if you keep keep your answers, you know. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, um, no, according to our 
remember, I mean, uh, we say that the coloniality is an option. It's not uh, claiming the truth. Nobody can claim the truth, even they claim the truth. We don't believe in that. So in our narrative, no. Capitalist needs races, and races has to be maintained while capitalism is here. So our point here is that it's okay, the kind of anti-racist things that are going on today and have been going on for a while. That is very important at the level of transformation, but we have to aim also simultaneously in a different direction. If uh, the system sustained by what we call capitalist economy uh, is not uh, transformed, dismantled, or whatever. I mean, it's not doesn't become something else. Um, Racism and capitalism goes together, and so uh, climate change and uh, and all of that. I mean, and this the and the point here is, uh, as Einstein said, in a different context in the physics, uh, the problems we have today cannot solve with the same mindset that created the problem. So that's why we have to extricate ourselves and look, find some other path. Great. Okay, thank you. Our next question comes from Elizabeth, Elizabeth uh, Pinarali. Um, she says, hi, Professor Mignolo. I read the idea of Latin America and thought it was fascinating. So I'm curious if it is possible to separate racism from the colonial matrix of power or are they permanently linked? Uh, can you read a little? I think I understood, but uh, because the volume was a little bit low, if you can read it again. Okay, sure. It says uh, this is um, from Elizabeth Patina Rowley. Yeah. Uh, she says I. She says I read the the I quote the idea of Latin America, end quote, and thought it was fascinating. I am curious if it is possible to separate racism from the colonial matrix of power, or are they permanently linked? So that's kind of related to the last question, but it's a little different. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's uh, related. It is very interesting. No, as Quijano said, racism is foundational in the colonial matrix of power. It's constitutive of the colonial matrix of power. But I think that the, the, this question in relation to the previous one is very important to clarify another thing in our view. Um, Capitalism is not our vocabulary. Capitalism is a modern concept. Uh, liberal like uh, Max Weber like capitalism. Marxists like Lenin don't like, doesn't like capitalism, but they agree that there is something called capitalism. Marx didn't talk about capitalism, he talked about capital. That's something else. So we talk about uh, economic coloniality, as I show you in, in the diagram. If we say, or Quijano says sometimes capitalist, he means not capitalist in the sense of Marxist, he means capitalism in the sense of the colonial matrix of power. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, our next question comes from uh, uh, Jaron Rudd. Uh, do you believe that the epistemological reconstitution of third world knowledge will require an amplification of the particular axioms, cosmologies, and cultural worldviews of separate groups? Or do you think an opposing structure to that of modernity slash rationality in the form of a collective movement or an epistemological project uniting the shared colonized subjectivities of colonized peoples is necessary to be effective beyond the power of narrative or ethnography, for example? Well, that is a lot of question in one. <laughs> Let me see how can I get to the <clears throat> to the center of it. I think that the key word that the, that uh, appear in that question, but uh, is becoming more and more important, is cosmology. Uh, now I am um, in, in, among all the things that uh, we do beyond writing and teaching. Is kind of participating and organizing work, investigation, uh, conversation. 
Um, and, and it's a project led by uh, Clapperton uh, Chakanetsa Mabunga, who is uh, from Zimbabwe and is also in the MIT. And I started the project uh, last year in the Max Planck, Planck Institute, where he was a fellow. And we are very much into that, into the kind of the cosmological reconstitutions. And at the same time, the cosmological re reconstitution um, make, you, make you think about that the West doesn't talk about itself as cosmology. Cosmology is what the rest of the world has. And what is very interesting here is that if you look for Greek cosmology, what you get is Greek mythology. And I am in conversation with the Greek anthropologist the last month because I read a chapter by him about cosmology and I contacted him and I said, uh, well, that's very interesting because he was talking about some African uh, cosmology. I said, what do you think about Greek cosmology? And he said, wow, I never thought of that. Let me think about it. And he's, he's Greek based on Greece. So you see how, I mean, what happened what happened with, uh, with uh, Western cosmology is that became Christian theology. As I said before, Christian theology incorporated secular Greece and destitute Greek cosmology was plenty of goddess. There was plenty of people. <laughs> so that was not convenient for, 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 for Christian theology. They needed one God. So, and when you look at, uh, for the little I, I, uh, I know, I began to investigate a little bit that, the, uh, when you look at uh, Greek cosmology, it has much more to do with Aymara cosmology, with Nahuatl cosmology, and there are people studying this. So the question to go quickly, that is why pluriversality is important. So we can know, or no, there is no just one people who can do it all. So the question here is coalition between different people in the world who are into this kind of reconstitution. And that is very important because we have to extricate oneself, uh, ourselves to the modern idea that we need a new universal model. That is gone. Uh, in another argument, I talk about we are no longer in a in an era of changes, where you can solve all the problems, say new or post, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, there is no transition anymore. We are not in a transition; we are in an explosion, and the explosion is a is a change of era, not an era of change. And that you have to kind of recognize modestly what you can do with many other people who have the same problem, but in a different geopolitical arena, the different body political arena, uh, different vocabulary, a different kind of non-Western languages. And that is kind of, it's very exciting. It's very exciting if the climate change or some kind of nuclear mistakes <laughs> uh, don't destroy us, but I hope that it won't. So, I am, uh, I am optimistic uh, about this pluriversal explosion of people reconstituting themselves, their own being, their own knowledge. Uh, that, as Fanon said, I mean, Fanon said at some point, well, colonialists are not happy or satisfied with just taking the land and controlling the people for some kind of perverse logic. They take away their knowledge and kind of destroy them. And that is the kind of destitution, what we call the colonial wounds. And colonial wounds are many, and different scales. Great, okay, yes. Um, I think we need to hear something like that, particularly in the university. Um, all right, so our next question is from Rafael, uh, Rafael Loris, who is one of our own faculty members here at the University of Denver. Um, he says, fantastic talk, congrats. I would like to ask uh, how decoloniality relates to the task of decolonizing people's minds after political decolonization and authors such as Fanon. 
How different is that task in today's more globalized world with alternative non-Western, i.e. Chinese models of modern nation in the world in the 1960s? Which of course you've sort of answered in part, but maybe you want to address a little more specifically how Fanon uh, applies to right now when we're looking at the whole spectrum of, of globalization. Great, great, great question. Yes. Um, yeah, I think one of the many things that is very important in Fanon, and, um, and let's take the wretched of the earth, and we'll mention two things here. <clears throat> yeah, that the wretched of the earth, uh, uh, the earth start with Algeria, but end up with the third world. So he's kind of addressing uh, the third world. People are also addressing the, the, the processes of decolonization in the sense that decolonization, as I said before, has at that time, which is um, building the native or indigenous uh, nation state. But uh, he said something very important also in that uh, very uh, uh, dignified anger conclusion when he said, um, let's forget about Europe, let's build a new man. Well, he said men, everybody was said men at that time for human, but what he was saying, we need to build a new humanity, uh, and we have to take that in the sense of what humanity means in the, in the pen and, uh, and, and the mouth of a black Caribbean guy. Obviously, it doesn't mean the same thing that humanity for the Renaissance people. So that's all the kind of the problem of vocabulary that <coughs> we um, so uh, uh, we have to deal with because we are trapped by the Western vocabulary. So what has changed today, uh, uh, the changes, the change of era, I was saying before, there are many signs, but in relation to your question, um, I will mention two or three. Number one is that uh, capitalism is global economy. So uh, global coloniality is, is global. But there are, at the level of the state and at the level of the corporation and at the level of the bank and at the level of the media and the technology in this interstate sphere, uh, is what I call de-Westernization. And de-Westernization is led by China, but also supported by Russia, Iran, but also outside of, uh, of, of, of the East. I mean, in Latin America, uh, uh, the moment of uh, Chavez and, La and, and, and Lula and Evo Morales and Kirchner <coughs> um, and Mujica in Uruguay, they were kind of not turned to the left, they kind of de-westernizing politics. Why de-westernizing? Because they didn't question capitalism. But they kind of began to kind of establish solid relationship with Iran, with China, and with, uh, and with, uh, with Russia. So in the case of China, they, they, they are kind of extricating themselves from neoliberalism. So they are rebuilding the knowledge based on Confucius mentioned, et cetera, et cetera. So when I say that, people say, well, but that is there being used by the state. And I say, you're absolutely right. <laughs> that is what they are doing. But because the West want to kind of control them under the name of democracy and human rights. And democracy is a state concept. I mean, not only used by the state, but control, hmm? controlled by the state and controlled by the media who work by the state. So that is different from the, um, the time of Fanon, because at the time of Fanon, I mean, Lumumba or many other kind of countries, at some point in that struggle, they had to join uh, Russia, even Cuba, that were not kind of pro-Soviet, but at some time they had to join uh, the Soviet. So at that time it was kind of communist, state communism against liberal capitalism. But today that uh, that kind of, and, and both capitalist, uh, state communist and 
liberal capitalists were two brothers or cousins of the European Enlightenment, right? While de-Westernization is the reconstitution of their own languages, history, thinking, etc., etc. So that is for de-Westernization. And decoloniality, decoloniality is the work of the political society, not the civil society, which is civilized and and proceed in a civilized manner, but the political society is the disobedient society. The, 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 uh, the society that uh, manifests um, discomfort and satisfaction in many ways. So decoloniality is one path in that kind of reconstitution of the political society. And, and we do two things now uh, uh, there. One is kind of articulate how we conceive and do decolonization through decoloniality. And the other is to understand how other people are doing it. And that understanding uh, allow us to make coalition. And that is the point. Uh, and that is Lugones', Lugones uh, contribution, to make coalition. All right, well, thank you. Um, our next uh, question is from Azita Ranjbar, uh, and you and you answered the first part of her question, but not the second part. So I'll read the second part. Um, you mentioned China, Iran, and Russia as examples of de-Westernization through contesting Western Western imperialism. Yet all of these states have used anti-colonial rhetoric to justify the brutal repression of racialized others. For example, China's repression of Uyghurs. Russia's deplorable treatment of Central Asians and Iran's repression of Iranian Kurds, Arabs, etc. In this sense, can we delink de de-westernization from decoloniality to center other forms of decolonial geopolitics? Good question. I never said that uh, de-westernization is not repressive or de-westernization is not oppressive. Probably I didn't make clear and I will try now. Uh, You know, uh, the failure of Cheney and Bush uh, presidency is that begins the disintegration of the Western cognitive empire because people began to doubt about that. So when Obama came in 2008, he realized what the situation is. And so what he's trying to do is to <coughs> reconstruct, uh, at, I mean, the Western legacy that is being lost. So we can say here that for, from 1500 to 2000 is the is the project of uh, the process of Westernization of the planet. 2000 we began to see the sign of de-Westernization. So Obama uh, started the re-Westernization process that is going on today, and re-Westernization is the counter-reformation. So the westernization is not, I am not saying that it's not oppressive. Uh, what the westernization is doing is not questioning the colonial measure of power, it's questioning who controls it. And that we have to understand. While decoloniality for, uh, for us, for me, decoloniality allows me to say what just I just said, because I am investigating the trajectory, the history of the colonial metric of power. So on the one hand, allows me to understand what is going on today in the globe, but on the other hand, to extricate myself from both de-westernization and re-westernization. That is something that is beyond people like us in the kind of the political society. When we cannot go to Davos or the IMF or the Asian kind of meeting in uh, Shanghai, etc., etc. So that is very important to know where are we situated when we talk about decolonization and decoloniality, not just in uh, our self and our context, but in the global order that uh, we have today and that from since Quijano we understand from the perspective of the history of the colonial mix of power. 
All right, thank you. We still have quite a few questions left. Uh, are you okay with going a little longer uh, to get these questions answered or are you getting- yeah. If I don't collapse, if I collapse, well, you cut. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, we'll, we will have eight o'clock, uh, excuse me, seven o'clock is our absolute cutoff time though. So this is from uh, Yessi Ortega. Uh, I wonder if you can provide some light on practical ways in which we humans can escape from the matrix you have depicted today. How can we move away, move forward, from the underlying forces of capitalism, neoliberalism, and globalization rooted in modernity? Well, that's a good question <clears throat> because uh, <clears throat> that kind of take us back of uh, the we. <clears throat> the we in general, I mean, I use the we in the sense of we, the guy that follow Quijano, but also I use the we in the sense of we, the, per the people who are of European descent in this continent. Uh, even if we are descending from the settler <clears throat> or descending from um, immigrants, like is my case, Italian, Brussel, German. So your question is a problem for us people of European descent. The First Nation, they don't have the problem of extricating and delinking. The, the question they have is how they kind of <clears throat> how they kind of reconstitute and don't lose what modernity destituted. So the question is different from uh, just limited to the America to the different kind of demographic group from where some kind of politics emerged. So I see that I work with people in the Andes, with Aymaras and Quechuas and some <clears throat> in Ecuador. And, and that's what they are doing. They, what they are doing are kind of reconstituting their own memory, their own languages, but they never lost that. They are reconstituting because they kind of was kind of shaken. Um, but now there is a tremendous confidence and empowering themselves. And also in Canada, I mean, when you read and see what Leanne Simpson, Glenn Coulter, uh, when you listen to Think Thinker uh, and uh, Vine Deloria, I mean, they, they just, that is the kind of, uh, so the same thing, uh, uh, Linda Smith, I mean, they have, a, the, the First Nation have their own different project of, say, decolonization as reconstitution. And the same for the African diaspora in the Americas or sub-Saharan Africa. There is a lot of things going on now. I mean, uh, Ashil Membe and Felwin, Felwin Sar, for example, uh, they have been uh, leading a, a kind of thinking there, but also, I don't remember the name of uh, Gassendi, uh, uh, Sabelo Gassendi is a complicated uh, name. He's uh, from uh, from Zimbabwe in South Asia. And now he's in Germany. They are doing this. So uh, there is uh, the case of uh, Felwin Sar, uh, who, together with a French colleague, uh, wrote a report on restitutions, restitution of African pieces in the European Museum being restituted uh, to Africa. And that is a very interesting nociological problem because when the piece of the, uh, the piece were extra uh, extri uh, extracted from the original context, they went to European uh, uh, Museum as object. So now the question for uh, Felwin Sar, I don't remember the name of the colleague, is not only the politic of restituting those that Macron is supporting that, but they have to reconstitute the knowledge uh, and reconstitute the kind of the context of, uh, of, uh, of those uh, uh, returning objects. So the question is, um, yeah, the question is that, that there are, and, and if you talk about, uh, I don't know, we, what we call uh, uh, LGTB of color, for example, in Europe, they have another fight, and that is what I mean 
Investigation is beyond the university. It is at the university, but it's not limited to the university. And it's absolutely necessary to orient action. And I repeat, what we do cannot longer fell in a global universal model of decolonization, decoloniality or whatever. This is the way we do it, the we <laughs> after Quijano. But there are many other ways to do it. And the question is to make coalition with the people who we feel we are walking in the same direction, but following different paths, but parallel paths next to each other. Okay, our, ne our next one is a, um, a comment more than a question, and you can say something if you want to respond to it or not, or I'll just read it. Uh, and it's from an anonymous attendee. The black feminist scholar black Bell Hooks is described to explain, quote, white capitalist heterosexual patriarchy, end quote, with its sex, gender, racial capitalist system as the root of coloniality in much simpler rhetorical style and language. It seems like Hooks has already theorized decoloniality, coloniality in an accessible way to academics who don't seem to cite her at all. Um, I hope you will consider reading and citing her too. Really what? I hope you will consider reading and citing her too. Um, oh, that is a very interesting, um... That is very interesting thing. Maria Lugones, Maria Lugones works a lot with kind of intersectionality. Um, so for me, the question is very simple. I mean, yes, we recognize that uh, Maria, as I said, Maria Lugones, the, that work is, but uh, there are different languages and there are different vocabulary and uh, we don't have to quote everybody uh, to kind of follow in the, the completeness of quotation that Western Academy creates. Um, so the question is what kind of argument we build and not, uh, and not if we quote everybody that could be meaningful. So the, the, the experience of the language of Crenshaw is, is parallel, that's what I just said, is parallel, but it's a different geopolitical and body political constitution. And I don't think, and that is very important, to try to subsume one position to the other or pretend that one position is superior to the other. So that kind of hierarchy is what Aguijano said. I mean, uh, that is what we have to eliminate. We have to establish coalition and not dependency. Okay. Uh, next one, we've still got a few more here and uh, we're just ripping on here. So this is from uh, Ruben Ramos. Um, it says, great lecture. Could you speak more to the influence of Christian theology and gender structures and race in this European invention or construction of humanity? Uh, Christian theology, races, and <laughs> what is he, what are, what is he doing? Um, so, yeah, uh, I'd be glad to do that. Um, I would say three things. <clears throat> I think, uh, first of all, I think that Christian theology, by creating one God, um, I don't know if, I, I don't know what I'm going to say, the, the kind of Greek cosmology was, was in that direction or not. But yes, I can assert that what happened to Christian theology in relation to, let's say, Mayas and the, the great civilization of the, the New World. What Christian theology uh, did was to translate duality in many existing cosmologies into dualism. So dualism is oppositional, men, woman. And that is just not semantic opposition, that was a social opposition. Because men were supposed to be superior to women, and then you have a God that support that, because he created uh, Adam before, and then uh, Eve, kind of, uh, because of <laughs> because of Eve, they lost the paradise and all of that. So, in 
and in the kind of the cosmology in the new world, the dualism didn't exist. It was duality, and duality is always complementary. Duality is too moiety. I give you one example: uh, Ometeotel. That the Christian said, the, the missionary said, <coughs> the the God, the God of the Aztec was Ometeotel. It was not a God. They didn't have God. Ometeotel was energy. Ometeotel was the name of an energy that created the universe. And one aspect of that energy is that Ometeotel was a dual energy. And among that kind of dual energy was what we call feminine and masculine. So the entire universe is feminine, masculine, and all of us, I mean, feminine, masculine are two moities complementary. They complement each other for the regeneration of the species. But at the same time, we have in all of us the feminine and the masculine, and we prefer or sense or feel one or the other. So this is very interesting uh, in terms of sexuality because then in this kind of heteronormati heteronormativity connected with races, you have the LGTB plus. So you LGTB plus, with, whether, I mean, if you are white or you are the color of color, there are kind of different things. So that kind of bring another dimension of, of the question of gender um, heteronormativity force you to some to your preference, but uh, now people are reconstituting themselves. They say, well, if I feel like that, why I have to kind of follow what they want me to follow? But then you have also the case of uh, the Native American, as, uh, as I know it, uh, when they say, well, listen, I mean, LGTB, that is your problem, is not ours, because you are responding to uh, the question of nor uh, heteronormativity. Uh, for us people, two-spirit people, was just kind of normal in our communal. So two-spirit people kind of doesn't have to the link, have to kind of maintain that because two-spirit people were never themselves, I understand correctly, linked to a uh, Western Christian heteronormativity. They were rejected. They were kind of destituted. El pecado nefando used to say Bartolomé de las Casas when he kind of was looking at two men together uh, having sex. So that is, you see, the, the question is how this play in relation to the, uh, uh, the cognitive Western domain or uh, uh, empire. And, that, and again, that is a question of knowledge, because this knowledge, heteronormative knowledge, is the racial classification of theology and the science that govern us. But at the same time, you see all over that people are disobeying. They don't believe anymore. They don't buy that anymore. And that is the coloniality at large, not necessarily that they kind of have said many times, and uh, uh, everybody uh, understand the coloniality as we do. Okay. Um, our next question, um, and, 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 and by the way, I'm, we've, we've got too many questions here in the q and I can't, we can't get to all of them in the next uh, five to 10 minutes, but I'm, so I'm gonna skip around from those who seem to be different than what we've been you know, talking about. Uh, this is from Angela Parker. Um, I'm curious about decoloniality in the context of the rise of the far right that we're experiencing in the US, Brazil, India, et cetera. Is the process of decolonization the only answer? What strategies and tactics are most important above and beyond reinvesting in indigenous knowledge systems when the far right grows more and more aggressive as their assumptions are challenged? Oh, that, that is a great question. <clears throat> that is a great question because, uh, number one, to fight against um, injustice, uh, fundamentalists, you don't have to be the colonial. 
you have to just have common sense. You have to just common sense and kind of an ethics, uh, responsibility to live in society, doing something to uh, counter things that you see as injustice. <clears throat> Number two, uh, the race of the, the, uh, the, the extreme right is a, is a consequence of, uh, in, in the 20th century, I'm not talking about, <coughs> I am not talking about fascism or uh, 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 um, Nazism or Frankism, <coughs> uh, Diego de Rivera, for example, before, the, before 1950, I'm talking about what we're seeing today uh, in Europe, mainly in Europe and the United States, but then we have things like Bolsonaro in Brazil. So all of those are consequences of uh, neoliberalism. <laughs> it seems to me clear that neoliberalism kind of created the condition uh, <clears throat> to the insatisfaction of people who voted by uh, to Trump, the people who voted for Bolsonaro, the people who um, voted for Orban. So the first thing we have to do is just to understand from where the bullets are coming. <laughs> and the third thing is that um, the far right is controls a discourse and controls the media. So the far right are not just people doing things. There are people with arguments. And that is knowledge. So what is decolonial? And, and knowledge to do what? To convince people, to lobby people. So you don't go directly to, to kind of attack the Orban or Bolsonaro. You have to work at the level of the people who believe or don't believe and give argument to kind of don't vote for them, not support them. But the question is that uh, there is not a kind of a strong kind of knowledge yet, argument, because that, I mean, the, the task, the, that task was the task of the left, but the left kind of uh, failed. And, and I was reading today that uh, the disintegration of the left in France will have as a consequence Macron against Le Pen. So the left in Europe and in, in Latin America, kind of out of the game. And out of the game mean that they don't convince people anymore. So the question is the coloniality is that option. That now is kind of beginning, uh, but beginning. Uh, but that, 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 is, that is the question. I mean, that we work at the level of knowledge and transformation of the knowledge we have, but also uh, not disqualifying, but also showing the infrastructure of that knowledge that create that effect of reality where in the West, neoliberalism and national fundamentalism are against each other. So that is the kind of re-westernization because Trump was re-westernizing us uh, at his way, different from Obama, but he was re-westernizing. So Macron, so Orban. Now the question will become more complex when we look into China, Iran, Russia, etc. Why? <laughs> because they have an additional problem. Beyond dealing with kind of their domestic problem, they have to deal with the constant harassment of United States with the European Union cooperation and the NATO. So the thing is very, very complex and that is why thinking decolonially means to kind of understand how the colonial matrix of power was formed, transformed, and how it's operating today. Okay. <laughs> And finally, our last question uh, comes from my own colleague, uh, Deepa Sundaram. Uh, is decolonizing forms of knowledge simple? 
uh, similar to what uh, Dipesh uh, Chakrabarti calls the provincialization of Europe. Could we create a pluriversity that is genuinely epistemologically plural, that respects and learns from multiple nociologies? Would we really be able to learn from each other without a shared boilerplate for producing knowledge? Well, for the, the second point, yes, that is the aim. <clears throat> that is the aim, and uh, in order to do that, we have to work at that. So how do you work at that? Making coalition, uh, organizing and participating in different kind of uh, activities. Mm -hmm. Now I am participating in uh, what, at least three. I mentioned the, the cosmology and the people from all over the world, from Africa, from China, from Vietnam, from Kerala, India, from uh, from Brazil, uh, from United States, uh, from New Zealand. So you have to make those things happen. They don't happen by themselves if you don't kind of look for how to do it. Uh, yeah, but that is the task. The task is not just thinking. I mean, I write books, but uh, and I write articles and I give speech like this one, but. Uh, but I have another activity that takes a lot of my time and a lot of pleasure also, which is this kind of activity. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, I, I can I can keep on talking about uh, 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 different things you do with different people. Some you are the leader, some other people are the leader, some are, you are co-leader, etc., etc. So Chakravarti, yeah, I mean, that is a kind of one of the cases in which um, in which we, we walk um, uh, in the same direction <coughs> from uh, uh, a different path. Uh, he said, yeah, he called that provincializing Europe. Yeah, that, that we are talking about something very similar. Uh, when Quijano said, uh, about, uh, before Chakravarti in 92, we have to, uh, it's not the question of rejecting, it, we have to extricate ourselves from Europe is to reduce Eurocentrism to its own size. And that is the task of, uh, so that is one uh, kind of connection and also difference, but I mean difference, uh, surface difference. And the other is that um, uh, Chakravarti is within the post-colonial and we are into the decolonial. We are not enemies like uh, Protestant and Catholics in the 17th century. Uh, uh, we are friends. Sometime, sometime um, they critique us, like uh, for example, the last article by Arjuna Padurai. I mean, they didn't critique. I mean, he praised the book, but at the same time, uh, he said that Catherine and, and uh, the project of Catherine and I in on the coloniality is to return to a pristine past. Now, you tell me if every, anything I said tonight, I am proposing a return to a pristine past. So uh, the difference in between the post-colonial and, and the decolonial uh, uh, in a word is that they are post-colonial. I mean, post-colonial is, is after post-modernism. There is no post-colonial before 1978 when um, Lyotard published the postmodern condition. But we come from Bandung Conference. The Bandung Conference was kind of decolonization, neither capitalism nor communist, but decolonization. So that was the Cold War, and that was dependency theory uh, in, in, in Latin America, and that was the time of the, <coughs> the, uh, uh, the Cuban Revolution. We come from Spanish and Portuguese colonialism. They come from English colonialism. So that those things uh, make a different skin, meaning a difference how we feel the world, although we agree. <laughs> uh, so Protestant and Catholic, they don't like each other, but they are both Christian. <laughs> so <laughs> post-colonial and decolonial, we is not we, are, we like each other. We have colonialism in common, but we do deal differently with uh, with colonialism. Right. Okay. <laughs> Great. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. It's uh, now seven o'clock, and we've gone over time, and there are still more questions, but I think we've covered a lot here. And um, I, I would just—I I know professors shouldn't say read my book, but 
uh, <laughs> Professor Mignola has written so much, I, especially the, the last book, uh, which I'm actually using in my class right now, which is actually taking place during this time. It's called On Decoloniality, and he wrote with Catherine Walsh, and I highly recommend that book. Uh, so uh, we want to thank everybody for attending. Uh, we uh, we had over a hundred attendees at one point here, and uh, and again, as been the case as I experienced when we've had you in other venues, uh, Walter, uh, our, we've got participants all over the world, which is what decoloniality should be about. So uh, I want to thank also again our um, uh, the Department of Religious Studies. Uh, for its annual Kirk Lecture and for sponsoring Walter here. And uh, so we're just, we're really grateful and I hope we continue the conversation. I would certainly like to see see this as, as you talk about in your book, it's not a matter of theorizing decoloniality, it's about doing decoloniality. And that probably the site where that should occur is in the university. Um, the American University curriculum as much as any place. Um, so uh, we, we look forward to that. And again, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'm going to stop recording now and I'll leave it on for a little while here, but uh, basically we're done. And so uh, if, I, I, if you need to leave, that's fine. I'll just- Yeah, continue. yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. yeah, you have been uh, talking for- so uh, could you, thank you very much. Thank you very much in the first place. I really kind of, uh, uh, I really uh, praise uh, this opportunity to kind of articulate uh, my thinking, but the thinking of the group. I mean, it's my responsibility, but it is something we have been doing together. So the second thing was, uh, can you copy the, the, the question that I didn't have time to address and I can I can uh, uh, address by writing, and then you can send to the. I, okay. I don't know if that is possible. Uh, yes, I can save the file of the of the Q and A. I think. Uh, I, uh, well, yeah, I can let's see if I can do this. Um, no, I can't. Uh, I don't know. Um, well, probably Jason. I'll, 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 I'll work. I'll work on this afterwards. Yeah, uh, probably Jason. Jason can do it. Yeah. Do you know how to do it, Jason? Oh, I don't know how to copy it, but since we're recording it, there will be a, a record of the the Q and A or the chat usually. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah. but the one the one that I didn't that uh, the, the 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 last question that uh, was not read. Oh well, there well more there's more, more than one. Yeah, so ah, okay. we will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we okay, will. So try you to... can copy that one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We'll we'll work we'll work on it. But anyway. We want to thank okay, you. See you tomorrow again. Later where you are. And so have a good evening. It was great. Thank okay, you. Okay. And see you tomorrow. So tomorrow okay. afternoon. <laughs> bye bye. Thank you, Jason. Bye bye.